Hello and welcome to this Union Solidarity International web conference. We're speaking today to Elise Buckle of Uni Global Union. Uni is the global union federation that covers the services sector and Elise is in the finance policy department. And we're going to be talking about uh, conditions in, in finance sector institutions, which will be interesting because we hear a lot about banks and we're often very angry with the banks, but what about the people who work in them? Um, thank you for joining us and welcome Elise. Thank you. So the first thing that, that strikes us is that um, it seems to us that the banks appear to have caused the financial crisis. We don't know all the details, but uh, they are the public enemy in many of our eyes. Um, and yet they continue to pay very high bonuses to the top level staff. And they appear also to be making um, a quite good profit despite the crisis. And yet there has been really, really large scale job losses in the finance sector over the past few years. Is that right? Yes, according to our last survey, it's about 300,000 employees that lost their jobs uh, since the beginning of the financial crisis. And this is the data we collected just for 21 countries. Uh, so, of course, if we had data for all the countries around the world, there would be even more. Um, and as you say, I mean, the banks are still making enormous profits and they are cutting jobs. So, for instance, HSBC, uh, they made around $20 billion of profit last year and they're still cutting 30,000 jobs. Uh, same for Deutsche Bank, $7 billion of profit and uh, 22,000 job cuts. Um, so the problem is really the system, the financial system, which creates uh, high expectations on uh, rates of return. So that means the banks have to make very high profits in order to meet these expectations from the financial markets. And at the same time, they are cutting uh, on their um, um, labor costs uh, to meet these expectations. Mm -hmm. So we'd like to make the financial sector more responsible, uh, making sure that these profits are actually um, uh, are actually being invested in, in employees and mm -hmm. human resources, because it's really the human capital that's going to make our financial system more sustainable in the long term. Mm -hmm. So um, would you say that this is a short-termism on the part of the financial institutions that they're under pressure to be seen to be profitable by the markets and the easiest way to maintain pos uh, profitability in the short term is to cut labor cost. Is that, is that a fair assessment? Yeah, exactly. It's, it's very, as you say, it's a very short term view and it's actually not good for the banks either on the long term uh, because as we see when there is a, a financial crisis Crisis, the banks also pay the um, So if we want to have a more stable financial system over the long term, something sustainable, you also need to have a trusting relationship between the banks and the, cons the consumers, mm -hmm. uh, but also between the banks and society at large. And so, because the other issue is that the employees from the banks are under tremendous pressure to sell a lot of financial products that are actually not in the interest of customers. Um, so that's why a lot of people are so angry with the banks. They, they've lost a lot of money. Um, so uh, the employees should uh, have the right to give some good advice to their customers um, so that they can build a, a trusting relationship with their customers on the long term and make sure that everybody is benefiting from the system. Mm -hmm. um, I'd, I'd like to repeat again um, just what those job losses were in case people didn't hear. I think you said 300,000. Um, and that's just in what was surveyed, so the figure is probably higher. And uh, for me, that is a that is a tremendously high cost um, that a lot of dedicated bank staff have paid. And once again, it, it seems that it's workers who are paying the cost for a crisis that they didn't uh, that they didn't cause. And the point that you raise about uh, bank staff being under pressure to sell inappropriate products is is quite relevant because we've had. Um, payment protection insurance scandal in the UK certainly, which is costing a lot of the banks a lot of money to, to sort out. Um, what can we do? Um, I, I'm thinking of this on different levels. What can we do as individual trade unions, as a global union, but also um, as consumers to 
to change bank behavior? What, and, and what kind of change are we looking for? Is it in regulation? Is it in union organizing? What, what is the solution to all of this? Uh, so you mentioned uh, regulation. That's a big part of the change. And actually, um, right now, I'm in the, at the, uh, the European Commission is trying to implement uh, around 20 new uh, EU legislations. So our role as a global trade union movement, but also for each trade union at level, is really to lobby uh, the European Commission, but also um, the, the governments in the EU, to make sure that these new legislations that will be put in place are actually benefiting society at large. Um, so for instance, we want to make sure that there is some better policy on remuneration. Um, that uh, because right now, as you say, um, the kind of ordinary people are losing their jobs, but the top managers are still getting very high bonuses. Um, so we want to make sure that the ratio between the salary and the bonus is is not so um, is not so big, and that there's more money going into uh, into income and less into these bonuses, with, which actually create incentives for people to take more risk as well and to sell uh, risky financial products. Uh, we also want to make sure there is some kind of ring fencing between the investment bank and the commercial bank, so that you know we'd like the banks to actually focus on uh, the, their core job, which is uh, being a public service, providing. Um, financial services to society. Um, so this is for households that want to have a loan for buying a house, for companies that want to invest, um, everything related to the real e economy. It should be at least a third of the capital that the banks invest um, rather than just speculation. Right now, speculation is actually the, the highest uh, portion of their investments, which makes the whole system very risky and totally disconnected from the real economy. Mm -hmm. So that's another big issue that is being discussed right now at, at the EU level. Um, the other thing is um, we actually work with multinational companies to make sure uh, they adopt a sales and advice charter. Um, and recent uh, an announcement from the new CEO of Barclays uh, about having a new ethical code of conduct, uh, which creates incentives for the employees um, to actually sell quality products to their customers. Uh, so for each bank, there's really a role, uh, the, the employees have a very important role to play uh, to make sure that uh, there is a new banking model which is more ethical and uh, which customers can actually trust. Um, so there's this whole, uh, a discussion about uh, changing the culture of inside the bank, you know, as with the employees playing a crucial role in this change. Um, mm -hmm. um, and as I said as well, uh, as I like to get global agreements with multinational companies, um, not just about sales and advice, but also about sharing profits, about increasing staff motivation. Um, also for banks to look at where they invest their money um, in terms of uh, uh, corporate social responsibility. Because of course, all these banks also have an impact on the environment, on uh, workers' rights in developing countries. Uh, so we want the bank to be uh, also more responsible in terms of their choices of investment. Um, that's that's very helpful. Um, I'd like to come back um, in a few minutes to some of the questions about ethical banking and some of the alternatives. Um, I just noticed that Lindsay has typed in a question which says, do you feel the problem with the way big financial institutions operate is political? Well, partly it's because um, I, uh, there was a bit of a paradigm shift um, in the 80s uh, with you know privatization, um, that the government started to step back uh, and there was a lot of deregulation of the financial. Um, so uh, um, the large financial institutions became so big and this is why we call it fail because now the governments, they don't really know how to control the situation and when there is a big bank that is being, bank uh, being you know, uh, bankrupt and uh, base out. Um, it's a big problem for the government because they try to re-inject money 
and at the end the taxpayers uh, are the ones who pay the bill. Um, so I think uh, after this, you know, in the 80s and 90s where there was a lot of deregulation and the political debate was kind of in the backstage and uh, the companies could do whatever they want, I think now there is a little bit of a backlash uh, with the financial crisis that's been hitting us since 2008 and there is a willingness at least from many governments to um, to make this debate political again, you know, to make sure that, um, this is left to the economy and to finance, but that citizens like you and me actually have a say, um, and and that we are not paying the bill for the mistakes of a few top managers who took too much risk. Um, so I think it's becoming more and more political, and that's also why we have new legislation uh, coming in. Uh, so there's an opportunity now, it's a window of opportunity to actually make some changes. Um, you, you mentioned um, earlier something about global agreements, but you didn't go into a lot of detail. So I would be curious to know how you would go about organizing and negotiating global agreements with financial institutions and how you would work with the unions on the ground, what those agreements might look like and what they would hope to achieve. and um, also, how viable it is. How um, are there any examples of, of this being successful? Is 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 it something that's that we should be putting some energy into? Mm -hmm. So what we're trying to do uh, is really to um, to have some top-down pressure on the company. So that's us at the global level trying to negotiate with headquarters of companies. Um, what we do there is we use our access to the global media. Uh, our Secretary General, Philip Jennings, is very well connected to international media, so uh, that's a way of really putting pressure on the banks um, because, of course, they, they care about their revision. Um, and at the same time, we need this kind of bottom-up pre pressure, this grassroots that we do together with our affiliates in the, nas in the countries, uh, their national offices. And um, it's very important that there is this pressure from inside and from the workers themselves. So we do some organizing campaigns in terms of recruiting new members for the unions. In some countries, it's also about setting up a union. In Africa and Asia, there's not always this. Um, so making sure that uh, the workers in each branch of the company at each country uh, are really getting mobilized, uh, pushing for change. Um, so it's having this kind of top-down from a pressure that we can we can secure some good uh, global agreements with the with the multinational companies. Mm -hmm. um, back to the question of um, different models of of banking, more sustainable, more ethical ones. Are there good examples currently, or do we need to to start from from scratch? I mean, I, I've heard of banks like Triados and the Cooperative, um, I don't know what your view is on them and you don't necessarily have to comment on specific examples, but is there good practice out there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are some, some good examples. We have to say it's getting more and more challenging to get global agreements. The banks are being more and more resentful. Um, so, uh, but there are some examples with BNP Paribas, uh, there was a European Social Charter which was signed with BNP Paribas. There are also a lot of discussions with Nordea and Santander, so there's a good social dialogue there. Um, what happens is now we tend to start by talking about some particular issues like sales and advice. It's something we did with Barclays actually. Uh, we started uh, working on sales and advice. Or BNP Paribas, they had this whole charter and now they want to extend it uh, beyond Europe. So sometimes you have to start with a couple of issues and maybe a, co a few countries or a region like Europe and then you tend to other parts like Africa or Asia. But it's hard to actually get the full global agreement on all the issues with all the countries right away. Mm -hmm. So we have to start like piece by piece. Um, and right now we're negotiating with Unicredit. Unicredit is very supportive of, of having an agreement with us, so I think that's going to get done pretty soon. Um, and Barclays is the other one where we think there is uh, some leverage because there's a new CEO, 
Um, there was a lot of announcement in the press. The company is really under attack and really wants to change its big image. Um, so that's another one that we want to work with uh, this year. So then the challenge becomes um, to, to establish an agreement of some kind as a pilot uh, to publicize it wisely, uh, widely to demonstrate that it's successful and it brings about a better form of, of, um, of banking and to use that, that example as a springboard to, to achieve wider agreements and bigger agreements with more organizations. Is that, is that a fair enough assessment? Yes, for sure. I mean, um, there's a lot of competition as well between the banks. So once we have, you know, we have some good examples like BNP Paribas or maybe Barclays soon, then we can use it to uh, to target the other banks and say, well, if you don't do it, um, you you will be lagging behind. So using a few examples of banks as leaders, uh, and I think there's really some potential for Barclays to be a leader of this new banking model. Mm -hmm. um, but let's see also what they do because sometimes you also have um, a lot of announcement in the press but of course we need to check what's happening on the ground in each branch and each country. Um, so for Barclays we work with our affiliates in Africa as well um, to see what's happening in Africa because um, sometimes it's, it's a totally different world between the headquarters in London and what's actually going on in Uganda or Tanzania. So it's something that we do very carefully, just really monitoring if what the company's corporate level is being implemented at the branch level in each country. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have very much time left, so I think what I'd like to ask you is, um, what is your vision for the sector? I mean, what, what kind of banking sector do we want to see? Um, what do we want to see for consumers? What do we want to see for the economy? And what do we want to see for the people who work in the banks? Uh, what's your vision of the kind of the kind of sector we could have? So I think number one is uh, making sure that banks actually invest in the real economy. Uh, so as I saw, uh, we want to have at least two thirds of the capital that is being invested into the real labor, um, for companies, for business, for households. Um, also for students who have a student loan, I mean, just making sure that it's um, um, the banks are serving society and not the other way around. I think that's really the basis. Uh, the second one, as I say, having this new kind of social contract uh, with, um, so making sure there is a sales and advice charter for each company, uh, making sure that the employees have a very good incentive to provide quality advice, selling more financial products, and actually being under pressure and sometimes getting burnt out. Um, so it's very important for both employees and customers that there's a, there's a good relationship there, good trusting relationship. Um, the third one is if we look at the long term, as I said before, if you want to have a sustainable financial system, uh, you want finance to be um, uh, investing in um, responsible projects as well. Um, so making sure that uh, the banks are investing in in, uh, um, in companies or projects where um, workers' rights are respected, where social rights, human rights are respected, but also where uh, we make sure that we're not depleting all our natural resources um, because it's all about making sure there's uh, equity between uh, people now, uh, but also equity, equity with um, the future generation. Uh, and I think that really our financial system has a huge responsibility to, to play for that. Um, Elise, um, thank you. That's, that's, very, that's very helpful. Um, Lindsay has typed a comment which I'll read. Um, My experience of the attempts to change banking culture is that they pay lip service to it, but behind closed doors there's still the same obsession with the bottom line. I would be interested to learn what you think we can do to enforce the cultural change needed. Um, quite a good question, I think. Mm -hmm. And um, if you're able to answer that, then um, I think we will all be very, very thankful to you. Well, I think the first thing is that there needs to be some political buy-in at the top level of the company. Um, so it's very important that the people at the top are walking the talk and so that these people are actually making banking ethical at their level as well. 
uh, you know, they can't really ask the ordinary bank employees to sell good financial products and take time for advice if they don't apply it themselves. Um, so I think that's really depending on the people at the top and their personality and their political commitment to, to make these changes. The thing, of course, is the whole um, incentive system and the remuneration system. Um, so right now in many banks, um, it's more promotion and more pay if you sell more products in terms, in terms of quantity, but not really in terms of customer satisfaction. So that's another thing where you could have more regular, uh, regular survey about customer satisfaction, and if the if the customers are happy or their financial advisor, this person should get promoted or you know get a better pay. Um, so it's also about the whole remuneration system within the bank and also the performance appraisal system, uh, which can which can really make some changes. Um, thank you, and um, I think that um, I'm happy to leave it there unless you would like to. Give us a final message, a take-home message, or anything else you'd like to add before we before we finish. I'd like to finish maybe with a little bit of a more positive message because I there, there have been a lot of bank bashing, and of course ourselves we are very critical of banks, but I think you have to remember that, that even the people above are still um, making a lot of money and and getting these very large bonuses. Uh, there are a lot of people like you and me who are just doing their daily jobs and uh, they are afraid of losing their job and we should remember that, that these people are human beings, you know, because there's this very negative Im image of the bankers and I think uh, we should remember that um, and yeah, make sure that uh, because these people, these employees are the ones that can make some change um, so we should support them instead of always criticizing them and um, giving them tools as well to make some changes at their own level. Uh, Elise Buckle, Uni Global Union, thank you very much for joining us and speaking about the role of global unions in changing the culture of banking. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a nice day.